<laughs> do a beginning drink there? Yeah. <laughs> oh, we're rolling now. Oh. All right. Dan. Yes. What's going on? Not much. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're a cop? Yes. Yes, I work for an uh, agency in uh, Northern California. How's that going? It's good. It's good. I've been there um, just over 20 years. Wow, 20 years. Yeah. So what did you do before, before you went over there? Um, I worked a lot of different jobs, um, odds and ends. Um, worked at a warehouse for a while. I was a, uh, a department manager at uh, Orchard Supply right after I got out of the Marine Corps, which takes me back to uh, um, that. Uh, I started out just out of high school thinking that uh, I wanted to go to the military. And, and I knew that I wanted to be in law enforcement at a at a young age just because i mean what kid doesn't grow up wanting to be the the cowboy in the white hat yeah. comes in and helps people and, and saves the day and helps people when they most need them uh the most so um i figured military would help me prepare for uh getting into law enforcement and uh so uh just before i graduated high school i started talking to the army recruiter and uh they uh they were working with me and, and had me take a test. I took the test and, and came back with my scores and my scores were high enough to where I could select uh, a lot of different jobs. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to fly helicopters. That was my, my dream. So uh, um, I told them that's what I wanted to do and they, they tried to persuade me otherwise. Um, they wanted me to go into something else. I, I didn't know how it worked back then, but now I know that recruiters are getting more for uh, certain slots, and so they try to direct you towards that. I didn't know that, but uh, so he was kind of scaring me, telling me, "Well, if you know you don't make it out of flight school, and you could end up being a truck driver or something. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's not what I wanted to do." So I was getting a little nervous, and then I got a phone call from the Marine Corps recruiter, and uh, asking me to come down and talk to him. And I told him, "No, I said I'm going to the Army. I'm good. I already have it figured out what I want to do." And he was very persistent, kept hitting me up, and. Uh, he told me, uh, just come down, we'll go to lunch, and uh, there's no obligation, and uh, just see what you think. And uh, at the time, I wasn't making a whole lot of money. I was working in a grocery store and thought, well, free lunch, that's pretty good. I'll do that. I'll take him for his free lunch. So um, I went down to the Marine Corps recruiter, and, and next thing you know, he had me watching uh, a video, guys running around shooting guns, blowing stuff up, and uh, man, that... Those guys are good at what they do. <laughs> this next thing I knew, I was joining the Marine Corps. I never did get that free lunch, but uh, <laughs> I ended up in the Marine Corps, went to boot camp, and uh, um, made what? it through boot camp. What's what year that? was that? What's that? What year was that? That was uh, 1990. Oh, wow. Okay. And uh, so I got into, uh, got, I got through boot camp, and uh, while I was in boot camp, I, I qualified for a, a special program they call security forces. And uh, um, within security forces, I qualified for presidential support. So I went in as an as a infantryman at first and then uh, went through security force training. I went to Marine Barracks 8th and I. From Marine Barracks 8th and I, I was, uh, I was deployed to the Gulf War as a heavy machine gunner. And uh, I was in the Battle of Kofji. We were actually in combat. And uh, then... Uh, came back after the war and uh, my security clearance was in. So I went to Camp David where I guarded President Bush for, uh, for a year at Camp David. Um, after that, I, I got out and was going back to uh, the, the Fleet Marine Force uh, in Camp Pendleton. And I ended up getting out of the Marines, I think uh, late 93. And then uh, that's when uh, I started working at uh, Orchard Supply and got the job there as a, yeah. um, as a department manager. How was that? How was that like in, in combat when you went to? Uh... That, it was uh, it was pretty intense. I'm not gonna lie. Um, there was um, there was one night uh, where we were my platoon was an advance party for the other two platoons in my company, and uh, we pushed north and we're um, had dug in. We we're settling in and waiting throughout the night until the next day until the rest of our company would get there. And uh, I remember you could always hear explosions from the, from the air campaign, but that night the explosions were getting closer and it seemed, something seemed off, something wasn't right. And uh, 
close to midnight, I remember my squad leader come running up to our, our, our fighting hole. And uh, for, for me, as a machine gunner, as an M60 gunner, um, it's a crew serve weapon. So I have myself as the gunner and I have an A gunner. And uh, so me and my A gunner in the hole and, and the squad leader runs up and, and he says, uh, he doesn't tell us what's going on. He just says, look, he says, if I come back here and tell you to, I need you to grab everything that you can carry and, and come with us or come with me. And uh, I was like, okay, and he'd left into the darkness. And I thought that was weird. And then the explosions were getting really close. And uh, so I knew something was going on. And sure enough, squad leader come running up to the hole. He said, let's go, grab everything you can. So I grabbed the gun, the tripod, and, um, and all the ammo that I could carry. And uh, we ran. And we left all our gear behind. We ran and we got into what they call the Saudi berms, which was these huge berms that the Saudis had built up to keep the Iraqis uh, out of Saudi Arabia. And we got down into this berm and uh, we were just kind of all settled in there. I remember looking down the berms and seeing all the, all the guys all lined up all the way down the berm. And uh, I remember a colonel come running up over the berms and told us to start digging in. And I thought to myself, well, it, that's no good. I left my entrenching tool on my pack, which is back in the fighting hole, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, my squad leader told me, he said, dig with the, the, the hands God gave you. <laughs> I said, well, very well. And I actually had my canteen cup, so I started digging with that. I dug a fighting hole with that. And, uh, and then at that point, the explosions were right on top of us. That It was like uh, we um, had been in a position between us. Uh, we were in between the Iraqis and this town of Kofji. And uh, the Iraqis decided that they were getting tired of getting pounded by the air campaign. So they were going to take that town of Kofji, and we just happened to be between them and that town. And so we had a, a, a battalion of armor and light infantry roll down on us in the middle of the night. And, uh, and the fight began. And uh, that continued on throughout the night until uh, early the next morning. Um, and they were able to, uh, I, they, throughout the night, I remember hearing the A-10 Warthogs come in. And I, yeah, there's a very distinctive sound they make when they shoot that gun. And, uh, and uh, Task Force Ripper came in with their light armored uh, vehicles uh, with the 25 millimeter chain guns and tow missiles and tow missiles are going off and um, tanks are blowing up. It was, it, was, it was pretty intense. I remember that night sitting there thinking, because of all the units to be in combat, I don't think my unit, being we were an infantry unit, we weren't, um, we were at the Marine Barracks 8th and I, so we were, we had been a guard unit for quite a while, so we hadn't really been training infantry for, for as much as a regular infantry unit would. So I, I just, had this overwhelming feeling like that I was going to die, that I, I, I just felt like there was no way I was making it out of there that night, that it was for sure, this is going to, this is it, and this is going to be, ha this is going to happen tonight. And I was, I think I was 19 years old. It was a pretty intense thing for a 19 year old to, to experience, you know. Was that the first time that you felt like that was, the, this is going to, this that, may happen tonight? That eminent, yes. There was no, I've never, to that point, had never experienced anything like that, where it was like, this is it. This is definitely the end. Uh, I just didn't feel we stood a chance with what we were up against. And, uh, but we fought throughout the night until the next morning. They were actually, the trucks had, when they dropped us off, they left and they went back. So we didn't have no way to get out of there. So the next morning, just, just about sunbreak, um, they came in with whatever they could find. They brought a regular... Um, five ton, they brought a, a wrecker, which is a tow truck and a fuel truck. That's all I could get. And so we piled the whole platoon on those three trucks. And I remember seeing guys hanging off the wrecker, the boom on the wrecker, they were hanging off the back of that. And there was so many of us and so few trucks that I had to sit on the roof of the cab, which was a soft top. And so I was sinking through the, the roof. And I was holding on to the heat shield on the exhaust of the truck as we were driving out of there, trying to get out of there. But, uh, but we got out and, uh, and we made it back. So, uh, so that was pretty intense. Um, but then, uh, but then I got back, uh, from the war and, uh, like I say, I went to Camp David and then, uh, you said you did something with the president too. Yeah, I was, uh, with, uh, president Bush, George Herbert Walker, um, him and Barbara Bush. And, uh, Guarded them at Camp David, as well as uh, Mr. and Mrs. Quails, the vice president. And um, how was that? There was uh, quite an experience. There was something that was just uh, 
very unique and not many people get to do something like that. I was, I was uh, very fortunate to get to do that. Um, not only are you spending weekends with the president and his family, but also any dignitaries that he would bring up. So we would get to meet a lot of people, Arnold Schwarzenegger and um, uh, Bruce Willis and uh, Demi Moore, Don Johnson, Melanie Griffith came up. They were all, they were both of those two where they were still married back at, the, at that time. George Strait came up and he actually sang for us. And um, that's amazing. Yeah, Arnold Palmer. It was just countless. Uh, the people that would, I think Andrew Agassi was there. Um, there was just lots of people. And uh, you would just see them in their regular state. So that was kind of what was so unique about it because that's Camp David is the place where the president can actually kind of relax a little bit and mm. uh, kind of be himself. So uh, was, the, the, the Bush family, they were just absolutely amazing people. Um, they treated you like family and they were really good to us. I really, really love those people. Yeah, yeah. That's going to be my question is how are they kind of on their own? They're it's absolutely awesome. People. Yeah. Just amazing people. Super, super people. Yeah, and, uh, it was, uh, I was there on, uh, George Bush's last visit to Camp David and I uh, actually pulled the presidential flag on his last departure when he left Camp David for the last time. And he gave a little speech before he left and he couldn't even finish the speech because he broke down crying. Um, cause he was so emotional. Uh, but that just goes to show you that, that how much he, uh, he loved the people that he worked around and how he treated other people. It was uh, pretty amazing. I was very impressed. Wow. So, so you get back, you work for Orchard. <laughs> yeah, so I started. <laughs> so you can find your yeah, skills there. <laughs> I'm working at Orchard Supply. I'm a department manager. And, uh, and then, uh, so when I was getting out of the Marine Corps, my last commander, uh, he was, uh, he was the coldest champion bull rider. So, uh, we got to talk in and he started showing me pictures and talking about his old days and I've always loved rodeo and cowboys so I thought that would be awesome to give that a try. So he, he, he worked with me and kind of taught me some things and uh, so I figured well I'll at least try it once and, and if I'm no good at it at least I can say I did it but um, if I'm good at it maybe it's something I should do more. Yeah. So, so I, I remember going to Morgan Hill and, and uh, going to a, a buck out there and uh, I, uh, I, uh, got on a bull and actually for my first time ever riding, I actually did pretty good. It wasn't too bad. And, uh, and I instantly fell in love with it. The adrenaline, the danger, and uh, the excitement from it. It was just absolutely overwhelming. It was amazing. So, uh, I was hooked and, uh, every single Wednesday from that point on, I would drive to Morgan Hill and, uh, go get on a bull. And, uh, <laughs> it just what do you i've never seen or, or tried anything like that you just so you get on it and just try to stay on it is that no there's actually a lot more to it that's what you would think and that's what i used to think uh, but it's actually uh um much more technical than that so uh you know you take your wrap and you put one hand in the bull rope and your other hand um can't touch the bull or yourself for eight seconds you got to stay on for eight seconds and so each time the bull jumps and he makes a move then you have to make a, a maneuver to counter that move and uh and if you do it right then it's just the most amazing thing in the world and you cover them and meaning you make it the eight seconds and you jump off and and uh it's an amazing feeling and then you buck off and it just makes you want to go back and try harder and, and, and try to do it again and they don't want you on there no they and and, and most of those bulls they, they know the game they're okay. most of those bulls they uh they're bred to buck and uh and it's like a, a, a dog that loves to hunt. These bulls love to buck. That's just what they love to do. And they're very good at it. And they know if you kind of lean to one side, cause you know, as so you ask somebody, what's this bull like? And he's out there a couple jumps and you turn back to the left. So you kind of cheat and kind of, kind of slide over to the left just a little bit. And he'll feel you there and he'll actually go back the other way. He'll turn back to the right instead of to the left. So, uh, they know what they're doing then. Yeah. I always like the dumb bulls cause, uh, those would just go out there and just buck the same every single time yeah. But the smart ones. Those are the tough ones, man. Oh, uh, and, and some of them, you know, you buck off and um, <clears throat> they're just, uh, they know their work is done and, and uh, they go about their business. But then there's the ones that we call the headhunters and they're the ones that just, uh, they're just mean. It's like some people, they're just honorary, <laughs> they're just mean. And as soon as they get you on the ground, they're coming for you. And uh, they're, they're going to they're gonna put a hurting on you. 
So, so at the time, you thought, so there's a, there's a business in this then. Oh, absolutely. Like, it's a, it is absolutely a business. It is all about, uh, and you can out. make money. You can make money. And back then, the money was okay. It's not like it is now. It's much better now. I still think it should be better than what it is. But uh, um, you, you can make some money if you're good. It's, the, the, it's a tough way to make a living, though, because you get hurt. You can't make no money sitting at home healing. So uh, if you're not riding, then uh, you're not making money. But, uh, you know, I, I continued to ride and then uh, amateur and then... Uh, Eventually, I got good enough. I went pro, and I rode pro for two years in the PRCA and uh, in the Pro Rodeo Cowboys Association, the Sierra Circuit here in California, and also in uh, the uh, the Bull Riders Only, which was at the same time when the PBR first started the uh, Professional Bull Riders, and then uh, eventually PBR bought the BRO out. But I used to ride in the BRO, which that's just a rodeo where it's just strictly bull riding. There's none of the other stuff. And you make money by like. Um sponsors or whatever or? you uh you, you help make uh like your traveling money because it's expensive you figure you're traveling all over the state if not all over the united states you travel your fuel your hotel food and then entry fees it costs money to get in these rodeos they're not free and yeah. you buck off you just lost all that so uh and you're on to the next one to try again so it, it can be very expensive so you could pick up sponsors which i did later on um in my career, I started to get a couple sponsors to help with the uh, with the traveling fees. But um, I think the most I ever won was about four hundred dollars. Um, but that was at one rodeo for eight seconds of work. When you kind of put it in perspective, wow. it's like, and it was the greatest thing ever. And you buck off, or you you know you make the eight second ride and you jump off, and you got like ten thousand fans are screaming and going crazy and then you go and pick up a check for four hundred dollars you can't tell me this it doesn't it's not going to get addicting so yeah. i mean it's it's pretty amazing um I, I absolutely loved that it was uh it was very addicting and i rode all over the state i rode the grand nationals the cow palace two years in a row and and, and uh and i rode some and i bucked off some um I probably wasn't the most talented bull rider out there because I started later in my life as opposed to most of these guys start when they're young kids. But uh, I was just kind of stubborn and determined and probably too dumb to know when I was bucked off a lot of times. So I always said I wouldn't open my hand until my head hit the ground twice. So <laughs> <laughs> times where I probably should have let go, I didn't. And that kind of got me through some of the rides that maybe I shouldn't have made. But um, it got to the point where uh, I knew if I was going to have the things that I wanted, I was going to have to get a real job, something steady yeah. that pays, you know, every month because the having money one week and none the next wasn't going to get it. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I still had that desire and that dream to, uh, to be in law enforcement. So, uh, I started applying and, um, I finally got accepted and, um, got hired with the uh, the agency here in North, Northern California and I went to the police academy and uh, so that once I got accepted that was that was the last ride so I quit bull riding how was the academy going from the Marine Corps into the police academy, academy was uh, it was easy it was yeah. it was actually kind of hilarious because I see a lot of a lot of these young guys that were and gals that were in there uh, you could tell they'd never really been in a situation like that before and so the panic would set in when um, when they would start yelling at us and try to pressure us yeah but it was it was I already knew that game and it didn't bother me a bit I thought it was kind of funny um, nothing like the Marine Corps no it was su camp, super easy it I actually enjoyed it I had a good time it was it was a good time so it was no problem at all but uh, like I said I'd already been programmed I'd been through uh, something that was much harder than that so this was it was a walk in the park really so you graduate the academy you get hired on or i'm sorry you get hired on and graduate the academy and then you hit the streets by the way this is very good whatever it you is. like it very <laughs> well what is it yeah it's apple juice <laughs> <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> um hit the streets in uh and then you start uh field training fto yes and then how did that go well yeah. how, how was when was this? What year was this? This is um, 1997. Okay. And uh, so I'm in the FTO program. And uh, 
even though I've been to the Marine Corps, I've been some places and done some things, I think I was still pretty naive to how the world really worked. I still didn't really know what really went on out there. So the FTO program was an eye opener for me. It was, uh, it was difficult. It wasn't easy. It was difficult because learning learning something new? or is it... you, You're learning so much stuff at one time. It was just a ton of information at once. And I was dealing with situations I'd never dealt with, obviously, before. Mm -hmm. I mean, you get thrown right into some pretty serious situations. And, uh, and you're expected just to handle this stuff and to relate to people and deal with people. And I, yeah. I was still just a kid. And... Uh, and this, this agency that you work for, this is this is a place that's, it's it's a mid-sized agency, but it's it's really busy. It's what, a busy place. It, it has one of the highest violent crime rates in the nation per capita. So the city is no joke, and uh, the the stuff is real. It's uh, very uh, fast-paced and a lot of a lot of crime and and a. Uh, um, uh, a very big diversity, like just about every type of crime that you could think of, and uh, so it was, it was kind of uh, a culture shock for me, and um, it was just a lot to take in. And I think it's a it's a it's a hard job to do when you're young and you don't have life experience or a lot of it, and, and there's no way to get it really until you get out there. But uh, I think it's very hard when you're younger. Um, it was for me anyway. And uh, it took me a long time to uh, to really get a grasp of it, but I just remember just living, eating, and, and sleeping that job for the the first year. Yeah, is there anything that stands out? Any any particular call or incident that, that stands I, out? I, I had a I had a TO. I think it was in my fifth month. Um, he was a good TO. Um, he was a good guy, but he was he was tough. And um, he loved to try to get me as much paper as possible, meaning, you know, because back then we hand wrote reports. And so to get me as many reports as he could. And so anytime there was something going on, he would come on the radio and tell him, hey, we'll take that. So we'd go there and I'd take the report. And then mm -hmm. before I even mm -hmm. have time to sit down and write it, we're on to the next one and then the next one. And, uh, I remember being down like nine reports, you know, at one point uh, and um, trying to keep all the facts straight from each one. Of course, I have notes, but notes will get you so far, right? Yeah. And, uh, and so a roll call each night, you know, you sit in, your, in the front row because you're the rookie and, and, and you're, you know, playing the game and doing your thing. But uh, the big joke between the senior guys was to see how many reports Lowry was down, you know, and course I wasn't enjoying it they thought it was hilarious but I was not having fun at all I was frustrated and uh, probably a little angry but um, but I was just you know kept my head down and just did it kept my mouth shut my head down and just do my work and just keep knocking it out because I knew it wasn't gonna last forever right and uh, and it wasn't until later on that I realized he had actually done me a favor when I'm out on my own and I would get down three or four reports you know, other people are all stressed out and freaking out. It was nothing for me. I was like, hey, yeah. that ain't nothing, man. I've been down nine reports in a night. So yeah. four reports, that's a piece of cake, man. And it just kind of, he was actually trying to set me up for success, not for failure. Yeah. So he wasn't purposely trying to be mean. He was purposely trying to help me. So um, it actually was pretty cool. It was just rough. It was just rough in the beginning, man. Yeah. How long is the, is the training program for that department? Um, so you would uh, normally go through a, about your sixth month in your FTO program, you should be getting recommended for your P1. Uh, it could go longer. It usually doesn't go shorter. I think I heard some guys in their fifth month getting uh, recommended, but and I've heard guys going like up to nine months. I'm not sure where the cutoff is, but it's right around there. It's usually six months, and then you usually get your P1, if you pass your P1 board and didn't be out on your own, but you're still on probation, you know, until you're 18 months. So, so P1 is like when they're out, when you're you're just a solo officer. Yeah, that's so your solo beat officer status okay. there at that point. So you can actually go out and, and answer calls on your own. And I remember, I remember being a young P1 and being nervous all day long. Kept thinking, well, what if I get a call and I go to it and it's some strange call that I've never dealt with before because they can't, 
possibly go over every single scenario in the world. So what if I go to a call and <laughs> they, all these people are looking at me to fix their problem and it's something that I don't know how to fix, you know, yeah. you, you have that, 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 that concern, but it's just cause you're new, but you, you know what to do at by that time. Yeah. You, you know how to handle it. It's just, uh, it's just uh, pretty scary when you're sitting in that patrol car and look over to the other seat and there's nobody there to fall back on anymore. It's but, all on you now. Yeah. And I remember, I remember one time looking in the rearview mirror and seeing a patrol car behind me and thinking, oh man, uh, this cop behind me, I better slow down. And I hmm. realized that I was actually... <laughs> you are the cop. I am the police. <laughs> <laughs> now, are you, were you from the area at the time or were you familiar with the? With I was from area? a nearby town, so I didn't really know much about this city other than that it was pretty violent. And uh, um, it's a nice town. It's just, uh, there's just a lot of violence there. Yeah. There's a lot of gang violence and a lot of drugs. Especially in the 90s, right? Yes, in the 90s, it was really super bad. And I was in a town nearby, just next door, which was like a small little cow town that was real quiet and, mm. and easy going, and everybody knew everybody. So um, it was definitely not something that I was used to. And it's not a, uh, I didn't know the town that well before getting there. Okay. So you're there at the PD. Um, what assignments did you? Did you have? So after uh, after about three years on the job, I decided I want to try out for motors. I always wanted to be a motor, and I love motorcycles and everything about them. So did you ride before that? Yeah, a little bit. And I thought I knew what I was doing. I thought I was pretty good. You know, I had my little motorcycle and would ride it around, and um, thought I had it mastered. And so I, I put in for motors, and I got selected, and. Uh, went to motor school and it was actually one of the hardest things I'd ever done. Really? And I didn't expect that. I thought it was going to be a piece of cake and it was actually really hard to the point where I thought at some, at one point that I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to do it. But it's one of those things where it's really hard until you get it. And then once you get it, you got it. Yeah. And once that light bulb comes on, then you're good to go. But, uh, you gotta keep pushing until you get there. And, uh, and it's, one of those sayings where it's like one of the best decisions I ever made was to go to motors. It's, I feel like it's in my blood, you know, I'm a old school motor through and through. And I just absolutely love everything about it. Uh, I love getting paid to ride a motorcycle every day. So it's, and you've done that for, for how long now? I've been a, a motor officer for over 17 years. Wow. So I've been fortunate enough to get to stay back there where a lot of times you would get rotated out, but there was times where we were so short that they couldn't really afford to rotate people out. And after you build up some expertise, I mean, it takes several years to become an accident reconstructionist. And then, uh, so then if you don't have a whole lot of people, you get rid of someone and it's gonna be really hard to, to get someone uh, built back up to that, that experience level. So um, that worked in my favor and it allowed me to stay back there for, uh, for a long time, obviously. So it's not just riding motorcycles and riding tickets. It's actually stuff to, that comes with accidents there, or collisions. And there's actually there's a lot of stuff back back there in that job. Um, we uh, so we we handle all the fatalities within the city limits, day or night. So we'll take turns being on call, and uh, we'll handle the fatalities. And you have to do uh, the reconstruction. And actually, uh, you know, it's our job to determine fault um, and uh, figure out how an accident or a collision occurred and and who caused it and decide if it's you know is this going to be a prosecution case or not and um and then take that all the way through uh, the court system and uh we have on average about uh nine to 17 fatalities a year uh usually closer to the 20 mm -hmm. um 17 to 20 in that range uh we've i think we've had 27 fatalities in one year um so it gets uh it gets very busy back there with just the fatalities alone and then uh we do all the special events so we do travel control for um the hockey games concerts different things like that at the arena um parades pretty much any type of special event the motors will usually be working that and then they have also some uh some uh missions that we have to to work as well as dui missions and uh, um, primary collision factor missions and stuff like that that we have to go out and work. 
So normal car crashes, those are handled by the beat cop, right? Yes. And then, so if some, but if somebody actually dies, then yeah. that's when they call. So your community service officers are normally take care of most of the regular um, collisions, and sometimes the uh, patrol officers will have to handle one. And then, uh, but then once there's uh, once somebody dies as a result of the collision, then uh, then everything's just froze, and then we're called out to investigate it. All hours of the night. All hours of the night, as well as any type of protocol. Um, collision involving, you know, if somebody crashes and someone's seriously injured or killed um, due to a pursuit or whatnot, then we'll also get called out. Okay, for that. so like an officer involved kind of thing. Yes. Is there any, any collision that that we handled that? Uh... There's there is a lot of them. There's. I, I mean, that that stands out to you. No, but there's a couple. Stuff. I mean, there's so many of them, but so, there, I, a couple of them were really bad, just unbelievable. The the amount of destruction. There was a car. Um, that uh, was traveling at a high rate of speed, full of um, young adults, and trying to make a turn. There was no way they were making a turn at the speed that they were traveling. And um, they hit a, um, a light standard and actually bifurcated the car. The car actually split down the middle. And uh, there were six people in the car, and five of them were dead. And uh, the destruction in that car, it, it looked more like an airplane crash than, than a car crash. I had seen some pretty bad stuff to that point, but I'd never seen anything like that. That absolutely still, to this day, was uh, imprinted in my brain. It was unreal. It just shows how, how frail the human body is, I guess, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's I, I've seen some massive destruction and seeing people live through some stuff. So the body is pretty amazing on what it can handle. But then, um, I mean, we're talking just some huge amounts of velocity and, uh, and a change in velocity, obviously a huge change in velocity that, uh, just absolutely just decimates the body and, uh, just destroys them. And it's just unreal. And, uh, and you deal with it. I mean, you deal with it so many times, and then we have to go and actually talk to family members because I got to get a 24-hour history on the driver, find out what they've been doing for 24 hours prior to the collision, hmm. uh, as far as like you know how much they ate, how much they slept. We got to you know it gets pretty detailed, and so you're going to talk to these families, and uh, the the heartache is is uh, is tough. But I had a crash um, that was actually not a really bad crash. It was uh, kind of like a fender bender where uh, this older gentleman was pulling out of a parking lot of a business and just got rear-ended. And they pulled back into the parking lot to uh, exchange information. And it was uh, a young girl that had rear-ended him. And uh, then he went home that night, said he had a headache to his wife, and then went to sleep and then never woke up. So it turns that collision into a fatality. So I had to go talk to the wife. And uh, so I go to the house and she invites me inside. I sit down at the table and I'm asking her questions about uh, her husband and, and where he had been and what he had done prior to the collision. And uh, this is around Christmas time. And uh, after I asked the last question, she asked me, she said, uh, she said, what do I do? She said, I have, still have presents under the tree from him. She said, I don't know what to do. And the kids, they, you know, they have presents under the tree from him. And uh, it's just, uh, that was one of those moments that's kind of also like, just been kind of burnt into my brain. I'll never forget that. I was kind of speechless. I didn't know what to say. I just didn't know how do you, how do you comfort someone in that kind of situation? It's just absolutely horrible. So uh, it can be uh, it can be tough at times. But I love the investigation part because it's all physics, and you can't you can't argue that. There's all these other crimes where people say, well, you did this, and they say no, they didn't. You say yeah, you did, and it's just argument goes back and forth. Well, with a collision. I can say with complete certainty that this vehicle is going at this speed, and this is why, because it's physics, and there's, yeah. there's no disputing that, and uh, it's just open and closed. It's awesome, and if you know how to, to get the, the, that information, um, it's pretty amazing to you know, be able to, to present that in court. Well, something that people don't really understand, it, and, and I didn't either until I learned this, that um, it doesn't have to be some massive 
collision to kill somebody. It could be uh, it, like you like you mentioned earlier. It's just it's a it's a change of, of velocity. Yeah. So internally, I mean, externally there could be like no visible injuries. Right. But it's all internal. Absolutely. And it could be something as 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 I heard someone say is forty five miles per hour. Someone Absolutely. Could die from that. Absolutely. How does that work? Is it just because of the heart or something? It or? is. There's a uh, you know you have the impact of the vehicle, then you have the impact of the occupants. You know the the vehicle impacts the other vehicle or whatever it impacts and it comes to a stop the, the occupants are going to continue moving at that same velocity until they impact something which is the inside of the car and your organs are the same thing as a person inside a car they're inside your body so your body comes to a stop now your internal organs continue uh moving until they impact the inside of your body so um from what i've seen throughout the years the body seems to be able to handle a lot more of a change of velocity um, straight on as opposed to to a side impact um, seems that it would often transect the aorta and uh, and kill the person that way which again there would be a lot of times no outward visible signs it's yeah. all just internal and you've been to autopsy you have to go to autopsy we go to autopsies um, for uh, as, as a part of the, the investigation and uh, not my favorite thing something that I wish I could unsee uh, I would have rather never gone to one but I've been to hundreds of them um, but it's it's part of the investigation to kind yeah. of put all the pieces together. Right, right. I I can't imagine having to go to an autopsy and and especially when it comes to you know the obvious the you know children things like that. The but, kids are uh, yeah. We've had some of those and uh, I tell you those are rough, man. Those are rough. Yeah, yeah. That's that's uh, that's not not good. I don't like that. But so you did motors. Uh, and you've gotten on SWAT. I did. Um, you know, I at, at first I, I I thought I didn't want to be on SWAT because I had been in the Marine Corps and and uh, but I had this Marines have this 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 type of brotherhood that's just amazing. This bond, you yeah. know, and you'll always have that forever, and and it is really amazing. And so when I came out of the police department, I thought I'd still have that same that that there would be that type of bond as well. And and it was there in some places, but not really excuse me, to the extent that I thought it would be. And so I was a little disappointed with that. Um, and I had a, a friend of mine who uh, had got on, he was in motors and he had got on the SWAT team and he kept hitting me up to go. And uh, so finally I decided, okay, uh, I'll, I'll try out. And uh, I tried out and there was three spots. And I think there's several of us that, that tried out. Uh, I was number one out of the three that got chosen. And, uh, I got on the team and as hard as it was, even especially in the beginning, it's really hard like anything else. You got to pay your dues. You got to put in your time and, and you got to work even harder than everybody else when you're new. You got to prove yourself. And that's how it should be. You got to earn it. Yeah. Anything that's given to you is just definitely not worth what it is when you earn it. And uh, I can't imagine now being at that department and not being on the team. It's... Uh, it's a it's a brotherhood like no other and it, it's amazing when you go into uh dangerous situations with someone over and over and over again you tend to just have this bond you know we yeah. we we bleed together you know we we go through all our our physical training and suffer together and uh it's just their their family you know and i'll tell you about a year and a half ago I lost my mom and uh, I'm very close with my family. We're a very tight knit family. And uh, I, uh, I've never had anything um, hurt me so much than losing my mom. It was one of the hardest things that I've ever been through ever. And uh, I'll never forget, you know, being there when, when she was, when she, when she left us, I was at her side and uh, I was devastated and I was uh, really having a hard time and uh, didn't know really how to get through it. I was struggling to try to find reasons to be happy. And I, Did you and your mom have a pretty good relationship? Very good relationship. Um, she's actually the reason why I'm actually in law enforcement because I had taken the test a couple times. You know, the first couple times I didn't make it, I would pass the test, but I would get um, dropped for... Um, what other reason I wouldn't make it on the list. 
and I was ready to give up, but she kept telling me, no, you're going to go back. And I was telling her, no, I'm done. I'm tired of doing this. And she's like, no, you're going back. And, and, uh, thankfully, you know, she's the one that kind of instilled that persistence in me and, uh, gave, gave me that, 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 that fight to go get after what I want. But, um, so when I, when I lost her, um, it was just, uh, obviously just a lot of hurt and pain and we were getting ready to have the funeral and my father was a complete mess and, uh, he was having a really hard time and I knew that if we had a lot of people at the funeral that he would, uh, he would be happy to know that there were so many people there, you know, and uh, so I was really afraid there wouldn't, I, I didn't know who was going to be able to show up and who wasn't. So I had mentioned to the SWAT guys that if, hey, if you're available this day, if you think you might be able to swing by, that would be really awesome and I'd appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, every single one of those guys showed up. Every single one of them showed up. Not just show up, they're all dressed up and, uh, and uh, they were all there for me because they knew I loved my mom and, and they loved me. So they were there and uh, it was truly amazing. It was uh, unbelievable. And I'll never forget that as long as I live. So it's, uh, that's a special bond when people you know, take time out of their yeah. day or out of their life to go and do something like that for you. So it's pretty awesome. An amazing camaraderie that, yeah. that exists not only in law enforcement, but, it's, but, but in a special unit like that where, yeah. you, like you mentioned, you guys are dealing with, I mean, situations where, you know, one of you could go down or something like that. Absolutely. And, and so it builds that, that bond. Yep. Yeah. You know, those guys are there for you and, and I'm definitely there for them. And, uh, no matter what. So it's, uh, it's pretty awesome. I and mean, it just kind of solidifies the reason why I went on that team and why I'll, I will not leave it until I just can't do that job anymore. And right. it's not, that's one thing that's about that job is that it's not about what's good for me. It's what's best for the team. So if I'm, yeah. you know, I'm getting older and once I get to the point where I'm not contributing and I'm not bringing to the table what I was bringing at one time, then it's time for me to go and make room for someone else. So and I completely understand that and I'm okay with it. It's yeah. as hard as it'll be to leave. Uh, I understand. Are you seeing a difference with, with the younger officers or younger generation Maybe not in SWAT, but but in the department, as far as different attitudes or behaviors or anything like that. It, I, I do see it in some of them, um, but I, I don't know if it's I don't know if it's a a, a difference in uh, in in the people as a whole, or if it's just just difference in people themselves, if that makes sense. As far as like you know, you got just different personalities, so I don't know if it's a trend. But I do see some entitlement where people just figure they're just, hey, I'm here, so, you know, I'm owed all these things, mm -hmm. and uh, instead of having to actually earn it, and uh, and go and uh, and earn your place and, and prove yourself, they just figure, well, I'm here, so just give it to me. So, well, and, like and it's a little disappointing. Yeah. Well, like you said earlier, it's it feels. You know, it, there's a difference when you when you have to go through something and you earn it, and then yes, but, yeah, and I I think a lot of times these kids they they just feel like you know they're brand new and and they're on a job, but they you would think uh, the way they act that they've been there forever and they got all this seniority and they've, they've been around all this time, but they haven't. You know, these guys that have been around for a long time been paying their dues. There's something to be said about that. Right. You know, they've earned their place, <clears throat> and uh, some people just don't feel like they have to earn it. And uh, like I say, you, you take anybody, you see, I see parents that give them their kids stuff, give them a vehicle. Even when I was in high school, these kids would get stuff given to them and they would just trash it and just destroy it and beat yeah. it up. Right. I had to work for everything I had and I had to earn what I had. So you, t you tend to take care of it and, and, and treat it a little bit better right. because you work so hard for it. It means something to you and you had to earn it. I think the, the, the military helped me. Was it, it wasn't everything but it was just one little piece of the puzzle that came together, right? And, and it took some years and uh, maybe even a, a divorce of my own to, to kind of learn more. And uh, you, I don't think you're really a good cop until you have several years on a job and you've been around and some, done some things. Cause, and, I, and I tell some of these young kids that come in now, I'm like, you're gonna go into these houses and you have 
this middle-aged couple that have this these huge massive life problems and this huge fight and now they're going to be looking at you yeah you're the police so you need to fix this so what are you going to do and and what are you going to tell them what do you know about it what do you know about life what do you know about any of this stuff you know you haven't even been through any of this stuff yeah you're not married you don't have kids no and now you're supposed now you're in a position where you need to fix this problem yeah and everybody's texting and and facebook and all that stuff it's all cool it's all fun stuff but i think you lose that personal touch and uh the the personal skills as far as um you, you have to have people skills and i try to yeah. i try to express that as like i can't emphasize that enough if you don't have people skills you're not gonna you're not gonna be successful at this job you'll get through but you're gonna be just horrible at what you do unfortunately you have to have people skills. You got to know how to relate to people, have empathy. That's the biggest thing. If you can't sit there, no matter what the situation is, no matter who this person is, I don't care who they are, you have to be able to put yourself in their shoes and try to understand where they're coming from and, and feel their pain and understand their issues to be able to help them fix their issues. Right. And if you can't do that, then uh, I don't think the, you're, you're giving those people the service they deserve. Because that's our job. You that's, can't be a tough guy. You have to go in there and actually listen to people. And you, you have to care and you got to think about the human side of it. It's not, it's, you know, maybe, I, I, I not maybe, it's definitely, I'm different than what I was when I was younger. Because even then, I, you know, even though I had the military, I still wasn't prepared. I didn't know. And uh, I, I think you have to just live life. I don't think there's really any way to teach somebody that stuff, you know. Yeah. You have to live life and you have to go through heartache and you have to feel pain and to be able to understand and help people and other people's pain and uh, be able to help them work through their issues and be compassionate and patient. And it's hard because there's so much negativity and you deal with so much garbage out there and there's so many people that are hating on, the, on, on law enforcement these days and, and you know the tide has changed and it's turned and, and there's so much negativity and so much craziness going on that you can get jaded and turn negative and just be negative everywhere you go with every contact but that's that's not helping anybody and that's not why we're here you got to remember the whole reason why we took this job to begin with because we want to be there to help people everybody not just the people that we like everybody doesn't matter who it is. So that, that's, uh, I think that's the most important thing in that job. How do, you, how do you deal with that? Because, you know, in the news recently, there's, there's always stories about um, officers that do something wrong. And there's always stories about, um, for example, a few, not long ago, there was officers that were killed um, just eating lunch. And so you, I would imagine that being a police officer, you know, you hear, you hear stories about the public not, not liking you, and then you hear stories about um, officers that are being killed for no reason. How do, you, how do you just keep going and doing your job? I mean, does it get, how does that play in your, in your mind, I guess? You got to kind of put everything into perspective, I think. You start to look and see where these comments are coming from. And it's normally from people that are on the wrong side of the law. So obviously they're not going to like us because we try to stop them from doing what they're doing. So, yeah, they're not going to like us. Not everybody's going to like you. And that's one thing my father taught me when I was young. He said, no matter what you do, no matter how nice you are, how good you are to people, there's always going to be somebody that doesn't like you. And that's okay. You've got to be okay with that. Yeah. If you're one of those people that everybody's got to like you, then you're probably in the wrong profession. You should be a fireman or something because everybody <laughs> loves <fireman>. those guys. <laughs> so you got to understand that there's always going to be negativity and there's probably more now than ever just because the social media has given those, that other crowd a voice, but that doesn't speak to the, to the, the larger population. And those are the people that, that are the reason why we do this job. And those are the people that, that need our services. They're the ones that, um, deserve our services more than anybody. I mean, even the ones that do talk bad about us, they still deserve our services and they right. will get them, you know, that we will come and help them because that's what we do. Even the worst of them that speak the worst of us, when they need us, they'll call us. They will because that's, you know, 
what they do. And we will come and we will help them because that's what we do. So it's just one of those things that uh, you have to deal with and uh, you got to be thick skinned and uh, you got to remember why we do this. And, and you'll have times where you'll, you'll run into, you know, we don't normally deal with that part of the population because they don't normally need the police every once in a while, but not normally. Mm. But every once in a while, you'll come in contact with them and, and, uh, and you'll be reminded why we do this and it kind of recharges the batteries and that's what you hold on to, you know? That's, that's where you're like, yep, that's why I do this. I did make a right decision when I decided to do this job. So, And that's something people don't understand or, or maybe don't, don't know is that there are people that don't like you that, that probably hate, you know, that just hate you because you wear a uniform, but you would still give your life to protect them. Yeah. Yeah, it, which you know, is unusual. It, it's it's you got to you have to admit it's kind of it's almost crazy to think about that that you're willing to to give your life for somebody who absolutely hates your existence. I think that's what makes it what it is, though. You know, yeah. it wouldn't be that special if you didn't. Yeah, that's what makes it so amazing. But it, I'll be lying if it, I tell you it didn't bother me or affect me or hurt me. Uh, there's a one of my wife's coworkers that didn't come to our wedding because her husband found out what I did for a living. Mm -hmm. I was like, what? You don't even, he hasn't even met me. He has no idea who I am. I'm actually a pretty nice person when you get to know me, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And like you say, all I'm trying to do is go out there. I just want to help people. I'm not trying to, to, to hurt anyone. I don't want to pin anything on anyone. I'm not trying to bust people. I'm just trying to do my job. And that's right. all it is. And try to help people and make sure everybody can can live this amazing life that we can live in this country and, and, and enjoy a, a good quality of life and not have someone prey on you and, uh, and victimize you. That's, that's all we're trying to do right. and nothing else. So yeah, that, that can be hurtful when, when stuff like that happens. And I don't normally tell people what I do for a living. Um, it's something that I just keep to myself because people usually judge, judge you for what you do. And, uh, They'll uh, usually uh, make some uh, assumptions before they get to know you. Once people know me, I'll let them know what I do. But until yeah. then, I don't usually say anything. And I don't, my family knows not to tell people. And I don't, don't talk about it because people just automatically think a certain thing. But then once they get to know you and then they find out, it's kind of funny how that works. And now it's okay. Yeah. But it's just how society is today. It's kind of sad the way things are going. But... Um, it is what it is. Yeah, that, that is sad, especially you, you're doing a job that's so honorable that, that you can't tell somebody when yeah. you first meet them. It's just, it's so unusual. Yeah, no, no, you don't dare put stickers on your car or, or anything like that because your windows will be broke out or your vehicle will get keyed. And um, it's unfortunate, but uh, it's, it's the, the career that I chose, so yeah. I just have to deal with it. But, you know, throughout my career, while well, being in law enforcement, um, I actually, at one point, I finally decided that, you know, I had been out of the military for quite a long time. I had been out of the Marine Corps for a while, and I still never really got to do that thing that I always wanted to do. I always wanted to fly, right? Back in, uh, just out of high school, I was trying to go to the Army, and they kind of talked me out of it. So, um, on the SWAT team, one of our SWAT medics, um, he was about my age at the time, and uh he actually had gone into the Army National Guard and was going through this um, warrant officer program to go fly helicopters. And I thought, well, heck, I mean, if he's the same age as I am, if he's doing it, then I should be able to do it. So I looked into it and I started putting my packet together. And it was uh, a very long process. There was a lot of roadblocks that tried to keep me from going at every turn. But I figured I'm just going to keep doing everything that I can do to try to make this happen because it's something that I still want to do. And I'm gonna keep fighting to get what I want. And uh, you know, I said my, version, my, my, my vision wasn't good enough. I had astigmatism, so I got LASIK surgery. Uh, they said I was too old, because I was 35 at the time, so I got an age waiver. Um, you know, I can't remember, there was several other things that I kept having to work around, but I finally, I got all the paperwork done, got it submitted, and I went to the board, and uh, I got selected. So I went to uh, went back into the I went into the National Guard this time, and I went back to uh, 
Fort Rucker, Alabama, went to Warrant Officer Candidate School for seven weeks, and then uh, went through uh, several other schools, SEER School and some other schools, and then started flight school. And uh, so I was going to fly Chinooks for uh, the unit here um, nearby where I live. And uh, while in flight school, they switched me to Black Hawks because a unit in California was going to Iraq and they needed Black Hawk drivers. So they switched me to Black Hawks. So I went through the Black Hawk school and graduated from flight school, came back. And that was uh, two years that it took me to go through all that. And this was in uh, 2008. Yeah, 2008. And then I got out of flight school in 2010. And um, my unit was down in Los Alamitos in Southern California. And I was home for about a month of training, but I had to go and fly while I was home for that month and get ready. And then once I got done, um, I left, went to Fort Hood and we flew to Iraq and we were in Balad and flew out of Balad for a year. I flew, uh, in the beginning I flew ring routes, which is just flying troops and, and equipment from one FOB to the next, one forward operating base to the next all day long, about 18, 19 hour days. And then I got selected for uh, night air assault. And I went to that and I flew night air assault for three months, which was uh, probably one of the most exciting things I think I've done. Cause it was, uh, they were delivered operations where we'd fly special forces um, into uh, targets at night to, to go and raid. Mm -hmm. So it would be usually a four ship mission at night under night vision goggles with very little loom. Um, and we would fly into these just just unmarked areas, just landing like nearby houses and whatnot and drop off the team. Then we would uh, fly off and logger somewhere and wait and listen to the radio until they were ready for exfil. And then there would be another location that we would be sent to go pick them up and fly them back. And uh, usually they would have prisoners with them when they would load back on the aircraft. And then, uh, so I did that for three months. Uh, it was exciting, but it was actually terrifying because it was just so stressful. It was very intense, very intense flying. And then, uh, well, you told me a story before where you saw this flash of light or something yeah. and this, tell me, <laughs> what was that story again? Where you thought this, uh, this was it, this is the end. I was actually flying, uh, ring routes and, uh, at night and we were flying into, uh, Washington which is, uh, it's a FOB downtown Baghdad, right off the Tigris River. And uh, so actually to get into this FOB, you actually had to fly down the river and then you would make a, a left 90 degree turn and then the FOB would just be right there. And so you had to come down and get slow and low before you made that turn because it was really close once you made that turn to final. And uh, so I'm on the flight controls, I'm in the right seat, I'm under night vision goggles, so I'm looking through these tubes and it's all dark in the cockpit and it's dark outside, pitch black. And uh, so I'm slowing back, slowing back, I'm about 80 knots, which is pretty slow, and uh, probably about 600 feet. And just about, just before I make my left turn, all of a sudden I see this bright flash and I feel this heat coming across the right side of my face. And I could see this, just this massive bright flash of light to the point where I actually close my eyes and turn my head. And as this heat goes by the door, and I just figure this, that's it. We're taking, I'm taking an RPG to the door right now. and wow. I'm dead. This is, it's all over right now. It's uh, I always remember thinking to myself, you know, I'd, I've been pretty lucky because I got through this whole thing to this point without a scratch. So I, I did pretty good. So it's not bad, <laughs> this, I guess. In a matter of seconds, yeah, this, this is all going through. Yeah, this is it. Yeah, I'm done. And then, uh, at the, at that moment, I realized that that flash of light was actually our flares, our counter def defense systems. When someone shoots a rocket at the aircraft, it, it automatically fires these flares. And when they shoot, they shoot down and forward. And I hadn't had them go off at night before. So I'd never, really experienced it during the daytime. You don't notice it because it's bright already when, the, when that flare shoots off. But at night, when it's peaceful, it's quiet, and uh, you're just concentrating on, on, on the marks that you have to mit, make to, uh, to, to make your turn and, and, and make your landing, uh, that, uh, that was just our countermeasure flare shooting and going across right in front of my door right there. Really of course, something was setting it off, but 
you know, yeah, we were okay. It was just the flare, not the, so, me actually taking a rocket to the door. After that, you're like, <laughs> "Don't get your heart rate up." It was an exciting landing. After I, that, <laughs> I, I can't. Yeah, I don't, it's, I, it's a little bit harder to land a Blackhawk when your blood pressure is shooting through the the roof. <laughs> wow, yeah, I I couldn't imagine. <laughs> and we we had a lot of there's a lot of exciting times flying over there. We had uh, almost got hit by a predator. Um, UAV drone aircraft uh, flew right underneath us at night near Taji. Uh, so they have their own drones out there yeah, too? Uh, we, yeah, we have drones out there flying around. Uh, oh, you mean our, our drones? It's, our, it's one of our drones, okay. yeah, okay. the Predator. And uh, he's, uh, I don't know where the person was that was actually flying it. He's obviously a long ways away from there. So when that thing flew underneath our aircraft about, about 15, 20 feet below us, that was, uh, that got a little exciting. That yeah. was what I call a significant emotional experience, you know, <laughs> that about balled us both up and took us all, both out. But, uh, and then, and then the, I remember the pilot of the, of the, of the UAV on the radio, cause we were talking to Taji tower at the time and uh, I'm trying to say that he wasn't where he was. And I was trying to explain to him in my, in my, in the best manners that I could, <laughs> that he was absolutely just went right underneath our aircraft. And yeah, yeah, that was a pretty close call. So, and See, I, I, I had actually, uh, I'll tell you one other incident. When it was when I was first got in the country and we we're flying, so we're flying out of Balad and I'm flying into this fob called Warhorse. And so I'm still pretty new in country. We're flying a, a UH-60 Blackhawk Alpha, which is, you know, the, the older models, got the smaller engines and, uh, and it's hot. And the hotter it is, the higher density altitude, uh, the less efficient the rotor system is and the harder the engine's got to work. And I'm um, chalk two of two aircraft uh, of a two aircraft flight, and so to get into FOB Warhorse, it's a very small FOB, and the LZ is right at the outer skirts of it. So you actually have to come down over this little road, and uh, you got to slow down because as soon as you get over the wire, that's your LZ right there. There's nowhere else to go. So you got to go from you know flying a thousand feet at, at 160 knots to you know landing on the ground at zero knots, but within a very short distance. So I'm chalked to the guy in front, he starts slowing back. So I start slowing back. I slide from a formation into trail, what we call trail. So I'm right behind him and I'm slowing back, slowing back and descending at the same time. But I'm still young pilot, still new. And I'm not thinking about the things that I should be thinking about. This heat, the high density, I'm loaded heavy. I got a lot of Joes in the back. Uh, I probably should start bringing in that power early, right? Um, but I'm now I'm like, he's slowing back. Now he's kind of doing a whoa boy. He's really slowing back. Now I'm like really standing the aircraft on its tail and I'm starting to lose him underneath the nose of the aircraft and I can't see him. I'm looking through the chin bubble to still keep visual on him. I can see his rotor system right below me. And uh, so I really dumped the, the, the collective, which uh, takes the power out and we start falling. And uh, so I start to bring the power back in to start arresting the descent and I bring in a little bit too much power. So as I start to pitch those blades, I'm pitching them, but I'm pitching them faster than what the engines can, how the, the, the speed of which the engines can spool up to provide the power for the increased drag from the blades being pitched more. And so the rotor starts to slow down. Your rotor RPM starts to decay. And uh, that's the first time I ever heard the low rotor RPM warning go off, which is like the worst thing the helicopter pilot can hear. It's like uh, rotor RPM is life. And, and I've heard it in the simulator, but I've never actually heard it in real life. So when you hear it for real, it's like, uh, oh, this, this is real. This is the real thing. This is happening. Does yeah. that mean that you can probably crash We're, at that point or that's something? That's usually what happens just before you crash. Oh. That's what you hear. And uh, so it's a beeping tone, a very loud beeping tone, and the red light comes on. And uh, so that, that low rotor comes on, starts beeping. And I'm just like, oh, man, this is bad. I'm in trouble. And... Uh, I mean, uh, the, about the only thing I could do was to lower the collective, which will then increase my rate of descent. And uh, it was one of those things where I don't have a choice. I got to lower the collective. I lowered the collective to get that rotor RPM to, you take that pitch out of the blade so that gives that the engine just enough time to start to keep, you know, those engines, they spool up. They're not instantaneous. It takes them a little bit of time to spool and get that power in. So you take the power out, you know, take those, the pitch out of the blades get that rotor RPM back and uh, I, I slid that thing in there 
we came in a little hot, but <laughs> <laughs> you made it. Though. We got it on the ground and we didn't stack it up, and I didn't hurt nobody. But for a second, I thought, man, uh, this might be bad. I might have just hurt some people, which is like my worst, my worst nightmare between flying and, and uh, you know. Um, when we came back from Iraq, I got offered a position here um, at, at the nearby unit to fly Lakotas. I took that. I went to the IPC course and became an instructor pilot. So I'm an instructor pilot now for the, in the Lakota. And, uh, so the, the, the biggest fear of mine is to, to do something to, to hurt someone in my crew or, or even someone on the ground. It's the same thing with, uh, with, the, with the job with the PD. The last thing I ever want to do is in my actions throughout the, the day, trying to help people, heaven forbid, I you know I hurt someone. It's uh, I think that's probably what I worry about more than anything. Uh, I'm okay if something were to happen to me. I'm okay. I know what I was getting myself into when I signed up for either of these jobs. I understand that and I accept that. But to harm someone else would be uh, uh, just uh, unthinkable. I, I know I had a, a crash on the motorcycle when I was pursuing someone. Um, and, uh, even I remember, uh, coming up to an intersection and the light was red. Some cars had, uh, had stopped. And so, uh, I thought I was good and I started to get back on the gas, but then someone in the further back in the line of cars got max. He didn't know why the cars in front of him were stopping. And it was actually a female and, and she, uh, she got mad because the other cars were stopped. She pulled out from behind them and pulled out in the middle of the intersection and now this car is right in front of me. And uh, so I grabbed a handful of brake and was doing everything just right, doing my threshold braking, had my head and eyes up on the horizon. And, and uh, but it was at that point where I realized I'm not gonna stop in time. I'm gonna hit this car. I'm gonna hit it hard. And that's when that fight or flight kicked in and I don't care how much training you do with trying to do that threshold braking at that point, your brain is thinking that break is is life. That's what's going to save us. So squeeze it. And it, you know, I eventually squeezed past that emergency threshold level and locked the front wheel, and the bike went down and knocked me out. And I slid through the intersection. And um, luckily, the bike nor myself hit anybody else. And uh, I remember waking up in the ambulance and uh, just being horrified to realize that I'd just been in a crash. You know, all I could think about was. You know, did I hurt somebody? And I kept asking the, the EMT that was working on me, I was like, did I hurt someone? Did I, did I hurt anybody? And uh, I said, no, nope, just yourself. I was like, all right, we're good then. <laughs> it's, it's all right. <laughs> but uh, that's, uh, that's one of my fears. I remember, I remember getting in a pursuit, chasing somebody, and uh, I got to this intersection. There was a, a crashed car, which was not the car I was chasing. And uh, so I stopped, I let the car go that I was chasing and I stopped to help the people that, that had crashed and I got off the bike, I started walking up to the car, I could see a child seat in the back and my heart sank. And I was just like, man, what did I do? What did I do? And I, even though I'm not the person running from the police, I think we have to, we have to focus on the person at fault is the person running, not because we're trying to do our job to stop someone, but nevertheless, it's on my conscience knowing that someone gets hurt because it's something that I'm trying to do, even though I'm trying to do the right thing. It doesn't matter. I still don't want that on my conscience. And so I walked up to the car just praying that nobody was hurt. And it was a young couple. And luckily there was no kid in the back seat, in the child seat. But that kind of brought a lot of things into perspective there for me that, you know, it's just sometimes you just got to wonder, is it worth it? Right. Kind of picking your battles and yeah. seeing you know what's yeah how, how does that so when you when you see these videos that they put online or whatever about the cops doing things or or questionable things or even even you know they were totally in the wrong i mean how, how does that affect you and so I, I look at them a certain way where i wish other people would when i see these videos i think okay that doesn't look good but I don't know everything. I didn't see the whole video. There was probably more before or after it. Um, but I don't know the context of which the video, the, the video had taken right. place. So, and that goes with pretty much anything. 
if I don't know, I mean, I, I don't understand. You know, people love to, to make assumptions and to talk about things they have no idea what they're talking about. So I try to reserve judgment and just, I don't know. It doesn't look good. And if the way it looks is the way it happened, that's bad. And it's absolutely unacceptable. But I don't know. So I'm not going to run downtown and start lighting things on fire because I don't know. I wasn't there. Yeah. I, I don't know. And a lot of times things can look one way and they're actually not that way at all. And I know from experience, so I've been in situations like that. So uh, I don't make assumptions. That's absolutely just wrong. With that being said, when, when I see there, that, you know, there are situations where officers do things that are just absolutely wrong, just hideous and are again, unacceptable and it's horrible. And it, that probably breaks my heart more than anything. And we've had in our department, you know, we've had people do things that are just absolutely wrong. But what I like about it is that they get called on the carpet for it. People say there's a lot of corruption and there, there's this blue line and they all, nobody talks. And that is the biggest line of BS that I've ever seen because when you do something, I guarantee you, you're going to be held to answer to it. And, and, and it's like, how do you, how do you think this even came to light? Most of these things, like the, the situation that I was talking about, because we found out about it or someone at the department found out about it. They investigated and they arrested the person and he was fired from his job. they will never work in law enforcement again because that's what we do. We, you know, we, there's no corruption. If there's bad people, we get rid of them and they go away. And it's very heartbreaking to the rest of us because we're over here working hard, trying to build trust with our community and, and, and do right by them. And then you got these knuckleheads coming along. They slip through the cracks, which they do everywhere. Every, everywhere I've been, I'm talking about the Marine Corps, law enforcement in aviation. We got people, in every one of those, every career that I've been in, there's always people that slip through the cracks. There's no foolproof way to keep people that don't belong there out. There's always going to be a few that can slip through one way or another. It's just a matter of time. You got to weed them out. Sometimes it's harder than other times. You might know they're bad, but you can't get rid of them until they give you a reason to get rid of them. But then we do. So, and it goes with anything. It's every profession. I don't just care what because, it is. Because we're humans. Yeah, we're humans. We're humans. And there's just evil in, in, uh, amongst us. And there's just, you're not going to wipe it out. You're not going to get rid of it. You're just going to have to try to deal with it the best you can. And I think that's what we do. And it, that you look at any profession, you're going to have them. It doesn't mean the whole profession is bad at, at, at all. Absolutely not. So, but when these guys do wrong, man, it's, it's crippling for us. Cause I mean, all the progress that we make, all the hard work that we do, it just sets us back, sets us back years and years. And it's like starting all over again. And it's so frustrating. You just want to grab these people and just choke them. And it's just like, what were you thinking? And it's not just them. It's, 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 they represent law enforcement no, absolutely. nationwide Anytime by, you're, by any action they do. Yeah. You're in an organization, especially law enforcement more than any other. One person does something. They say, ah, oh, those guys, they don't say, ah, oh, that person. Say, oh, that whole organization, oh, those are the police, they're all crazy and they're all corrupt. They don't say that one person, he's so corrupt. It's just, uh, unfortunately, how it works. So um, it just makes our job even harder. It is very frustrating. Officers get investigated a, a lot of times. Oh, yeah. You get for different things, even if it's not warranted, but they get investigated for complaints. Yeah. That's just how it goes. If you think you're going to be doing this job and getting away with things and you have no idea what you're talking about. I ended up with a day off without pay because I forgot that I had court one day. It was not my first time. It was like the second time that it had happened. It was years ago, but that was like the worst punishment I think I've gotten in 20 years was a day off for, uh, for missing court. And, uh, 
You, yeah, so if you think you're you're doing stuff in this job and we're all covering for each other, it's absolutely not true. Yeah. You you do something wrong, you step out of line and you will get hammered. And and, and most of the time rightfully so. Right. If you're rude to somebody yeah. and your sergeant hears about it or, or they complain to your sergeant, you're gonna hear about it. Right? You're it's gonna, not just, it's you not just were, sweeping under the rug. You are gonna hear about it. And you're wearing now we're wearing video cameras every day and they're always got to be turned on how is that for you now because it's, you started before there was cameras and now there's cameras it's so. frustrating it's good and bad the camera's good uh, um in, in the fact that i mean it says it shows exactly what happened right so right. someone tries to claim something happened and it didn't then you got it and i've had um some traffic cases where people try to say one thing but i have a video of them saying the exact opposite so that's good um, the bad thing is i'm used to not having a camera and i'm just a regular person and so I tend to say things that uh, <laughs> are wildly inappropriate, <laughs> but it might be hilarious at the time, but right. not when someone plays it back later. Right. So, I mean, think about it. You think, oh, well, that, oh, why would you do that? Well, okay, think about it. Go to work tomorrow and put a camera on and just turn it on and just film all day long your actions all day long and everything that you say. And then ask me later if that someone couldn't go back and look at all the things that you said and take any of that out of context and make you look bad. So no matter what profession, everyone's yeah. gonna say something that yeah. they probably would regret later oh on. Oh my gosh, yeah. Yeah. So Or using profanity or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd say things that you know, I'm always walking up to guys when we're on a scene or something and just joking around and then forgetting that we're wearing these guys still to this day, I still forget that I'm wearing this camera and <laughs> recording everything I say. So But for the most part they're they're definitely they're good. They're a pain. You got to download them all the time and it takes forever. You got to plug it in. You got to keep it charged. I got about a million things that I have to charge every night. Um, so um, it, it, it is definitely, and you got to put it somewhere on your uniform to where it doesn't fall off. As soon as it falls off, then they say that you did that on purpose. and mm. Or if you forget to turn it on, you didn't turn it on on purpose. And it creates a lot of issues. And uh, it also can get you in trouble if something happens and you didn't turn your camera on. So if something, uh, you know, you're, you're somewhere and you end up in a fight or someone pulls a gun or something happens, my first thought is not, oh, hey, I better turn my camera on. Right. But when you don't and that happens, you're going to get in trouble. You're actually in trouble. So you've got to physically turn these things on. you got to turn it on. And it'll back up. It'll give you like 60 seconds back from when from the time that you turn it on because it's always looping um, but it'll actually only save it and record it if you turn it on but uh, if you don't physically turn it on then it's not recording it's not going to save it and uh, and if something happens and you forget to turn it on it's not okay to forget I mean we all forget things right if you ever forget anything you forget your keys you forget anything yeah but if you forget to turn it on and you get into a shooting or something yeah you're done of force, oh you're then... done even if you did nothing wrong, uh, except don't for forgetting to turn yeah, the camera you're, on. you're done. It is a big deal now. So it, it, just, it just adds another thing uh, to everything that you got going on. So it just makes things more complex. And it's, I think maybe for the younger guys that, that they, they started out with it, that they don't know anything other than that. that right, I was going to say it's that. It's not the, a big deal. Yeah, I was going to say that the, the, the newer guys, they, they know nothing else. Yeah. This is what they know. It's yeah. To, to flap the thing down or device right. or whatever however it goes but yeah but for the, the people that have been doing this job for a while it's it's a transition to to get used to yeah and uh, absolutely <laughs> yeah that's that's interesting so i mean you've done a lot so you've done the marine corps you've gotten <laughs> you've done bull riding <laughs> you've gotten hard on with this uh with this agency is extremely busy uh and then you went back to being your uh Reserve with the Army. Yeah, National and, Guard. The National Guard. Yeah. Flying helicopters. Yeah. And uh, and you don't just fly helicopters. You actually build smaller ones now, too. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. I, I build the RCs. I build scale helicopters. I'm into pretty much anything RC, uh, whether it be uh, helicopters or trucks. I just love that kind of stuff. And I love um, restoring military vehicles. Uh, I have several of those now. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll get them sometimes in, in uh, a little bit of deteriorated state and then rebuild them and paint and, and um, just refurbish and bring them back to life. And it's just kind of like uh, bringing back a, uh, um, a piece of history and giving it a new life. And then take them around to parades and shows and stuff 
and the kids love it and the, the people really enjoy them and I get uh, I get to kind of share a little bit of our history and heritage yeah I, I mean I've walked around your, your compound and uh, <laughs> and you've got uh, military trucks and Humvees and, yes. and and all kinds of different vehicles it's it's really interesting yeah I think if I uh, if I could just do whatever I wanted my dream would just to be able to be here in my shop and just stay here and get to uh, just weld and, and, and fabricate and build stuff and just work with my hands and, and um, make things and work on my vehicles and ride my motorcycle every once in a while, um, then I'd be perfectly happy. That's yeah. all I really want to do anymore. But yeah, no. <laughs> but I stay pretty busy between, uh, between law enforcement and then uh, the, uh, the military and then with the, the department. We were going to start up a full-size air unit, and I was asked to research that, and then I was going to stand up the, the full-size unit and start, we are going to get a helicopter and uh, start flying for the city, and uh, then we had lost the funding for it, so that went away, and then we got some donations, and they were asked to start up a UAV program. UAV being? Uh, it's an unmanned aerial vehicle. Okay, so, so like drones, drones or something. Yeah, okay. so they wanted drones and so the drones are not going to be a replacement for an air unit they're kind of more of a supplement to an air unit but obviously we're not going to have the air unit but they still wanted to have that tool at least since we had the donations for it and uh, so then they came to me and asked me to um, be the chief pilot for the the UAV so uh, I agreed to do that so we put together right now I think 16 pilots I have four instructors and got everybody up and qualified and they're now flying the we have four phantom fours and two matrice two tens and uh those rotate throughout the, the patrol day and night and uh fly whenever needed to do block searches or whatnot mm -hmm. and uh it's a really good tool it really is and it's very helpful we can search uh, a, a block for a suspect in a quarter of the time that you can do it with uh, a group of officers. So, and uh, the officer safety thing is, is sure. huge. So it's a really a good deal. It's a great program. We have day and night cameras now. We, we have some amazing um, donations to be able to get all this equipment that we have. Hopefully we still will be able to have a full size unit at some point. Um, that's my dream is to be able to just fly for the city. That would be, uh, be awesome. It's definitely a need that we have, but it's just a matter of uh, funding because it's obviously an expensive venture. So these UAVs, they have like night vision and all that stuff? We too? do. We have uh, the Matrice 210. We have two of those and they have dual payload capability. So um, one has a Z30 day zoomable camera and it also has a, a FLIR camera. Wow. So. Wow. A lot of stuff you've been doing. Yeah. Yeah. It's been pretty busy. <laughs> been pretty busy. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so what's next then? Um, I don't know. I have uh, three years left until I'm 50 and um, I would be able to retire if we have a full size unit and I'm uh, flying um, law enforcement for the city, then I would stay. I'll stay longer. If not, then it's probably time for me to go. I think I've uh, had my fill of uh of all this it's been great and it's uh, been an amazing opportunity for me and uh, i'm very appreciative of it but uh it definitely takes its toll and i think i've had enough mm. and if i was flying i i love flying so much i think it would be worth for me to stay and stick around for uh for however many years after i'm 50 but if we don't get the air program going between now and three years then uh, i'll definitely leave uh, with the military, it's hard to say. Um, it's very demanding, and it's been it's been taking a lot out of me as well. Between the two careers, trying to manage both of them at the same time, I'm getting to the point where I'm uh, kind of wanting to slow down a little bit and just uh, spend more time at home. And it seems like with the military, it's kind of ramping up and wanting me to be gone more because there's always a mission to go on mm -hmm. all the time, and uh, it's starting to just to get to be a little bit much. I just want to kind of enjoy life a little bit and spend time here. I just feel like I've been away for too long. So uh, I'm getting closer to um, thinking that it might be time for me to 
to leave the, the army as well and then uh, just be here and spend time with my father. He's, uh, you know, the, the last of the family between, you know, other than my sisters and brothers, but um, I want to spend as much time with my father as I can because when they're gone, they're gone. I know that yeah. you don't get them back. So I would like to spend time with him. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much what I'm looking at now. Um, there's many possibilities uh, with aviation that I'm always looking at. And if something comes up, uh, I'll definitely uh, take a serious look at it. I've considered once I leave the department is going and flying seasonal in Hawaii for uh, um, doing the, uh, the helicopter tours there. I've <laughs> talked to them and they were... Uh, they were ready to hire me there when we were there. And I was like, well, I got to finish my other career first. Yeah. But then once I finish that, I mean, I do love going to Hawaii. So I might go and fly there for a few months at a time. I've yeah. never been, but it, it looks like it You've looks never amazing. been. No, I've never been. Yeah, it's definitely. Maybe unique. you can give me a tour. Absolutely. <laughs> the helicopter. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll fix you right up. <laughs> wow. That's, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's. Quite a lifetime. Yeah, it's been, I mean, uh, you know, I think uh, I've, my life's been great. It's been absolutely wonderful. Uh, nothing has ever, nobody's ever handed me nothing, which, which is the way I want it. I want to earn everything that I have. Uh, I've gone out and gotten what I wanted. And uh, there's been some sacrifice and some tough times, but uh, it's been worth it. It's been, it's been wonderful. I think a better life than I deserve. And uh, I'm very appreciative of that. And if it all ended tomorrow, you know what, it's, uh, I'd be still very happy. Uh, as much as I wouldn't want it to end, I want it to go forever, but it's, uh, it's been a hell of a ride. Yeah. <laughs> if there's anything you can do differently, to, if you can go back, what would that be? Oh, man, that's, that's a tough one. I think, uh, I mean, I don't think there's any way around it. I, 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 as, even though I spent a lot of time with my mom, I wish I could spend more with her. I would give anything to go back and, and spend more time with her. Um, and, uh, but the only other regret I wish I would have been able to have, um, I wish I would have been able to have kids, but it just wasn't in the cards for me. It didn't work out and that's just didn't happen. That's, that's okay. It's mm -hmm. just, uh, I think that would have been, I'd have liked to have had a son where I had that relationship with him like I have with my father. It's just pretty amazing, and uh, it's very special, and I like that. So, um, but aside from that, I mean, I've tried to live my life with as few regrets as possible. I never turned down an adventure. I always try to um, do everything I can and take advantage of every opportunity and uh, just enjoy it because it goes by so fast, man. But uh, it's definitely, uh, it's... Uh, it's an amazing adventure. I love it. Yeah, it's, 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 it just sounds like it. I, I, I've done nothing <laughs> compared to that. <laughs> I'm just here. <laughs> uh, one last thing. If you could, what's your one piece of advice to, to new cops, to new police officers that are getting into the business to, I think, to be successful? I think to be successful, um, you got to uh, always be able to change kind of like a chameleon with with the times because things it's always going to be changing it changed before i came on it changed throughout the time that i was on and it's still changing now so you always got to be flexible and be able to change with it and you need to learn how to be able to talk to people and be personable you got to be personable you got to be able to be a human being you're not a robot and you're not just you know spotting out penal codes and and you know that, that that doesn't that doesn't work and I try to tell people just because you wear a badge that doesn't command any respect anymore and and you gotta so that, I mean you have to earn it from every single person that you talk to and I think you have to learn to be personable be able to talk to people you got to be able to relate to people have empathy and uh, you need to be able to understand where people are coming from and try to honestly try to care about their problems and, and try to help fix their problems. I mean, if you're not able to do that, then I don't, I think you're going to have a, a very long, hard time at this job. It does, doesn't matter who it is either. The, the good guy, the bad guy, it doesn't matter who you're talking to. You got to treat everybody the same. You got to treat them all with respect and um, all the way that you would want to be 
treated because uh, I mean, we're all human beings, right? And that's what we're here for is to take care of other people. So if you can't be there for them and, and understand them and, and try to understand their plight, then uh, I think you're going to, you're going to have a tough road. So that's the key is, is respect. It is. is people respect. Yeah. And try to understand where they're coming from. Even though you maybe you never smoked crack or you've never been homeless, but can you at least try to understand where they're coming from and feel their pain and, and what they might be going through and try to relate to it. If you can relate to it and then try to work with them, it, uh, it's going to go a long way. I mean, there's some people you're just never going to be able to reason with. That's, uh, that's understandable. That's just how it is. There's those people, but everybody else, if you can relate to them, you'd better figure out a way to do it. So that's going to get you a long ways in this job. And I, I really buy into that whole program of, of, uh, of withdrawals and deposits, you know, you, you're making deposits every time you have a positive contact with a, with a citizen and the, and the withdrawals are any time you have a negative one, you know, you see, you kind of got to get over your own pride and, and, and let that go to the wayside. Cause it's really, it's not about you, you know, it's not about your pride. You got to, not get that feeling of like, oh, they're dis disrespecting me and my badge, and that that that's it's all it's all garbage, man. It's not about that. You gotta you gotta just be thinking about, how, how, you know, how how am I gonna resolve this situation? How do I relate to this person and try to get this situation fixed? You start feeling it starting to get out of control. You start losing your emotions. Once you lost your temper. And, and, and you lose your bearing, then you've lost the fight. So once that starts to happen, you kind of stop and hold on a second. And, and, and I'm guilty of it. I'm not going to sit here and act like I've always done it right because I haven't. But I've learned a lot and, and over the years. And now once I start feeling it kind of going sideways, I'm like, hold on, stop a second. Let's stop for a second. Let's just back yeah. this up. We're yeah. both people here. We can, we can figure this out. Let's just talk about this. It's 95% of the time. You can work it out. It's just that, you know, those few that you can't reason with, that's understandable. But yeah. everybody else, yeah. Just amazing how much being human can get you. And when I stop someone, and if I have to write them a ticket, and I write them a ticket, and, and, and they sign the ticket, and I'm walking away, and they tell me thank you, and they say, hey, you know what? You're the coolest cop that's ever pulled me over. And I, I just wrote them a ticket. That's amazing. That, that tells me I'm doing the right thing. Yeah. Cause I'm just being a human being about it. I'm not, when I walk up to a car, I don't ask people, well, you know why I pulled you over so I can get them to incriminate themselves because that's what they say in the academy. That's stupid. No reason to do that. I don't need you to incriminate yourself. And I'll walk up and say, hey, how you doing? What's going on? And they look yeah. at, you look at me like I'm crazy. They're like, what? They don't expect that. I'm like, hey, man, I stopped you because you're going a little fast back there. <laughs> and, and you're not I, stopping somebody because they're, just because they're going fast, you want to write them the ticket, but... It's because it's 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 that it's dangerous. That it's dangerous, and, it's, and it could relay. It, it could move into a uh, you know. It could end up as a as a collision. I just want to avoid collisions. I want to get people to think about their driving habits. It's easy to do, but what the thing is, you've got to relate to them. Is like I don't get enjoyment out of writing people tickets. I don't. I hate it. I don't like writing tickets. But if they think you like writing the ticket, and you're and you're getting a kick out of it, or you're getting your you know you get your one more and you get a toaster. I mean, then they're, they're definitely not happy about it. But when they, on, you, you put it in perspective and they understand why you're doing this, it's like, hey, you're going a little fast. Everybody does it. It don't make you a bad person. I do it. Mm -hmm. It's just, unfortunately, I happened to be there when you did it. That's all. You just got caught. It doesn't make you a bad person. It's just, hey, just we need to get you aware of your driving habits and make you drive a little bit more careful. And that way, maybe we avoid a collision down the road. That's all it is. And it's the thing that you've got to really think about is it's an infraction. This isn't some huge crime it's not i mean yeah it could end up something really serious right i mean it could i get that but it's not right now i'm just trying to prevent that we're not at that point so let's not treat it like it's at that point so uh, i think it's all just like keeping things in perspective and, and how you talk to people and how you treat people and and there's no there's no like you have to go out and write this many tickets or whatever. No, just, there's, they, just... there's been times where they've tried to put quotas on us, and uh, we reminded them that that is uh, illegal. You cannot <laughs> put a quota on us. 
Uh, of course, there is a work standard. I mean, you have to show something for what you did all day. I can't just go, you know, work all day and go ride around and come back and, and not have any tickets because they're going to want to know. Yeah, you what know, did you do why, all day? Why am I just riding a motorcycle? <laughs> which was, I would love to do if I could. Just running around. Yeah, for... if I could do that, I would do it because there's nothing better than just riding the bike all day. But I got to have something to show for what I, what I do. But I feel like I don't judge my self-worth on how many tickets I write. That doesn't make a good motor. Yeah. A good motor writes the tickets that need to be wrote because some people, the only way you'll reach them, the only way you'll really get their attention is hitting them in the pocketbook. That's the whole idea. They're like, oh, the city needs money. That's why they're doing it. This, we don't get no money out of it. The county takes all the money. We don't, we don't see any of that money. It has nothing to do with it. The whole thing about writing a ticket is just get someone to think about their driving habits. And the only way sometimes you can get to people is to hit them in the pocketbook and that really gets them to think, man, I better slow down so I don't get another ticket. And that in turn makes them safer. And uh, we've all seen it, that knucklehead driving just crazy down the street and you're like, whoa, he's gonna kill somebody. That's, that's, that's the ticket. That's the one yeah. that needs the ticket. When someone doesn't need a ticket and I can solve this issue by just talking to them and warn them and I can get the same results, I'd much rather do that and that's what I do. So the ones that deserve a break, they get a break. And the ones that don't, they have to get a ticket, they get a ticket, but they don't get attitude with it. I always tell people, they're like, man, you're, you're so nice. I'm like, well, look, I've been pulled over and I've gotten attitude and I was always respectful. I didn't really agree with that. I didn't appreciate it and I didn't think it was necessary. And I think that you, you get, um, a ticket you don't need the attitude with it that's just bad business sure no matter who you work for so um it's pretty simple i think actually let me ask you one more question one yeah. last question so what what would you say to the people that are transitioning from the military and getting into law enforcement any advice or or anything they should avoid or any particular mindset that they should have going into the business you know, I don't think it's a real hard transition. It's not that hard. You just got to understand it's not the military anymore. So um, it's a quasi-military establishment. Um, so you got to understand that it's not going to be the same. Um, it's not going to be as regimented. You might know, expect a certain level and it's not going to quite be there, but that's okay. Because it's, it's not the military anymore. It's not supposed to be. So, um, and... Uh, other than that, I don't think it's a really hard transition. I think it's a pretty, pretty easy transition from one to the other. Um, yeah, I mean, aside from everything else that we already talked about, just being personable and and your person, um, your your personal skills, just in dealing with people. That's the only thing that you got to work with uh, or, or work at more because maybe you didn't do that so much in the military. You were just around other military people, and just being able to. Uh, um, talk to people and relate to people, um, be able to learn to do that. And you know what easy way to do that? Sounds crazy, but just going out with your friends or going out to, to whatever social engagements and you just go and just talking to people and having conversations and just talking and just being able to sit down with anybody in the world, anybody, no matter where they're from, whether they're uh, the same person as you or completely opposite beliefs, but you can still sit down and have an intelligent conversation and just and, and have it enjoyable. You just, you just practice by talking to people and, and interacting and, and, and uh, getting along with just about any walk of life, then you're kind of starting to build that, that rapport of how you can just be able to talk to people and, and relate to anyone, no matter who they are. That's, uh, I think, the most important thing. Awesome. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you've done a lot. <laughs> yeah, again, a I can say again. So, Dan, I appreciate it. Thanks yeah. for sitting down and hanging out. Absolutely. Thanks for the drinks. No, it's a pleasure, man. I appreciate it. The juice. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll chat again soon. Right on. So, Sounds great, man. Again. Outstanding. See ya. All right. All right. Is that all right?